afternoon. We are just after lunch, which is uh, a pleasant time in the day. It's not exactly the best time to start discussing inflation and unemployment, but still, we'll do your best, or rather, my panelists will do their best to try and uh, bring to us the main aspects of this discussion, of this matter, in rather tough times. We are in Delphi, and in this four-day uh, Delphi Economic Forum of 2023, we are asked to think with the instrument of a paradigm shift overall, not in our subject matter especially, but still one of the questions I will bring to my panel is, are we risking to see a, pa a paradigm shift in the ways in which deal with unemployment after we have dealt with inflation? Also, social consequences. Also, the consequences as to the instruments deployed by other governments or the central bank to fight inflation. And being in Delphi, we might propose to the Oracle or to the discussants their uh, opinion about what will happen next. Where are we heading? To deal with this not necessarily easy matter, we have Ms. Anneli Ackerman coming from Estonia, a country that has had quite a bout of inflation as of lately. And I will ask her how did they fight and how successful they were, they were in fighting. Until some days ago, she was Minister of Finance of the country, but she's here as chair of the Finance Committee in the Estonian Parliament. So in a more debate-oriented situation, if I may say. We also have Megan Green coming from Brown University, chief economist and senior fellow with the American experience, one that I think is rather different from our thoughts in, in, in Europe. And joining us through the magic of technology, I hope we have Mr. Dejan Sosci from the University of Belgrade. If we don't have him yet, I'm sure that the magic will work at some time and we'll have him soon enough. So now, we have lived under a low inflation regime with low interest rates. And we thought that this was the norm, the new normal. The central banks were rather laid back in all that period. So we fought the COVID problem, and then we started fighting the energy issue, hoping for the best. The best is not present inflation-wise. Coming to you, Mr. Sackerman, how is it to awake one morning and have not just double digit, but very high inflation? What do you do? What did you do? Yeah, actually, Thank you and good afternoon for everybody. Thank you for listening to us. Uh, so, first shock for all Estonians was, of course, uh, to wake up uh, in our Independence Day uh, in 2022. It was our Estonian Independence Day where, when uh, Russia attacked Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And this is, in our re region at least, the most important uh, reason of high inflation and I would have been surprised if uh, inflation in Estonia has not been uh, as high or one of the highest in, in Europe because uh, we are very close to a war zone uh, and also our neighbors are uh, Russia and Belarus and Ukraine between them. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, we do not want to buy any more fuels from Russia, so we actually 
um, decided to implement a lot of sanctions. Uh, of course, energy prices were, were uh, hiking up. Also, a lot of uh, different supply chains uh, have been interrupted also. For example, we cannot get uh, wood for our forestry industry. We have big of it. Also for logistics, uh, for transport, for fertilizers, uh, import. Or we have very uh, big uh, parts of economy have been affected. This is the main reason. And of course, um, if we want to deal uh, for a longer period with inflation, we also have to deal how to, how to end uh, this war in, in Europe, which is uh, having influence all over Europe and all over the world, mostly. Was there a, a real problem in, the, in your public opinion? Were you pushed by public opinion to do something? And you just mentioned Europe. Did you feel more comfortable in dealing with inflation through belonging to the European concert? Uh, or more constrained? Um, actually, I would say that in Estonian public, uh, there has been a lot of uh, worrying about the high energy prices. And we addressed this uh, worry. We had a special uh, universal electricity package because mm -hmm. we have a state company which produces electricity and we made a law. Uh, they, they were selling it with uh, controlled, uh, with controlled uh, price and which, uh, which actually calmed down the uh, public opinion. Okay. So every, everybody in Estonia, also small enterprises and also local communities uh, can have with controlled price uh, electricity and it kind of uh, calmed down and of course uh, our uh, weather was very mild compared to other years yeah compared to years. other years so it went uh, more mildly than we had been afraid before but main concern in Estonia is of course because of the war what happens to our our, is, is our state safe? What will happen next? So actually, main concern of uh, public opinion is, is a war, that Estonia had been protected. And in this reason, uh, uh, as the energy prices uh, were subsidized and controlled, it was kind of fixed. The, the main issue still in elections also we had months ago was also safety of, of state and and getting peace in this region. Right, yeah. so you have other priorities Estonia. weighing heavier to, to the public opinion. Yeah. But uh, uh, before leaving uh, for, the, for the states, crossing the Atlantic, the Baltic Sea and then the Atlantic and going to the US, uh, on the other hand, I would say you had a fiscal situation compared to my country, to, compared to Greece, mm -hmm. at least, or to the South. European countries that allowed you to, uh, let's say, block part of the shock. Is that the case? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, our deficit uh, last year was not uh, anything, anything uh, worrying. It was uh, nearly one percent of, of a GDP. GDP. This, is, this is not. Uh, this is not uh, uh, something to cry about. Absolutely. But uh, this year's deficit uh, is expected to be worse because we have been taking loans, we have been rising uh, also family benefits, we have been rising also state defense costs, uh, 1% of uh, GDP. That's why we, we had made it with loan. But uh, as uh, last year was, was milder, Last winter was mild. Right now, the new government, uh, which mainly the leading party is the same, uh, has uh, has started efforts to to stabilize it much more. And uh, me, as a as a previous finance minister, I think it was the right way to, uh, to kind, of, kind of kind yeah. of buffer the the uncertainty we had last autumn in our society with with benefits and with insurance. Uh, we, we can support you. 
And right now, maybe it's, it's a good time also to make uh, uh, stricter fiscal policy. But uh, it's, it's not actually, I do not know, uh, very complicated for me because uh, we have uh, 33 percentage of uh, taxes of mm -hmm. GDP. This is not very high in, in our region. And we need to rise uh, taxes maybe 1 or 2 percent of GDP, which is pretty competitive. Um, compared to other countries yeah. in our region. So I think it's, it's doable. Yeah. Of course, it's complicated uh, to rise taxes, but it's doable, and we have strong mandate for that. So good luck. And now to turn to Mrs. Green. Uh, I think it was a, a, a president, an American president, that sa who said, give me a one-handed economist. <laughs> because economists are reputed to always say, on one hand this, on the other hand the other. I think it was Truman or who. Uh, how did you experience in the States this uh, surge of inflation in a country, I think, that did not have a very high unemployment problem to begin with? Has it been easier, or using the, the, the word easy in fighting inflation, is a no-no for you. Yeah, so I think the US picture around inflation has looked pretty different from the European picture. Also, the, the picture around employment has looked fairly different um, in a couple of ways. So in terms of inflation in the US, given how massive the fiscal stimulus response to the pandemic was relative to the US's GDP, um, you know, there was a huge cash cushion in society thanks to things like stimulus checks. Was it politically easy to give that kind of stimulus? Um, I mean, politically, it was possible, which is more than I can say now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, logistically, was it easy? Um, mm -hmm. No, mailing checks out to people wasn't that easy. Some people got checks who didn't need them. It wasn't a perfect solution, but the idea was that we had this horrible pandemic. We shut the economy down. We, we didn't have a way to target money very well, so we might as well just send it out and not worry about the consequences immediately in the hopes of catching people before they fall through the cracks. Um, as a result, though, we ended up having a lot of pent-up demand when the economy reopened. Mm -hmm. And so whereas Europe was disproportionately hit by the invasion of Ukraine in terms of the energy costs, for example, whereas the US is independent in terms of energy, um, demand was a much bigger factor and has been a much bigger factor in driving inflation higher in the US than it has been in Europe in particular. Um, the good news is that there's something central banks can do about demand. Central banks can't really do anything about supply side issues, right? The Fed can't manage energy costs um, at all. Yeah. It can't deal with food prices. But it can deal with demand, and effectively, central banks can kill off demand to bring it back in line with supply so that prices stop rising so quickly. Um, and so in a way, the Fed's been lucky in that it it actually has tools it can use to fight inflation. So what we've seen is that it, you know, interest rates have gone up by about 5% in just over a year. That's incredibly aggressive. Um, peak inflation is behind us in the US. That's not the case in the Eurozone, at least. Core inflation is still accelerating across the Eurozone. It's a bit different in different economies. Would you be willing to give us an explanation of this discrepancy? Or is it uh, a matter for the next year to, 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 for <laughs> economists to treat? It could be that the Fed has been more aggressive in hiking rates. And also, as I said, the Fed actually has tools to address demand issues, whereas the ECB can't really do much about supply side no. issues. Um, that, I think that's probably a component. Um, but it, so inflation, peak inflation hit towards the end of last year in the US and has been coming down, but it hasn't been a linear process particularly the sticky parts of inflation. So if you look at core services inflation, X housing, that's the Fed's current favorite metric of inflation. Um, it's been bumpy. It accelerates some months, it decelerates other months, and I think we can expect it to be bumpy going forward. It was never going to be a, a straightforward an easy, process. An easy way. Yeah. That's right. Um, now, on the employment side, though, I think the U.S. has also had a different response. So in the face of such aggressive monetary policy tightening, you would expect the labor market to deteriorate. And the labor market in the US is freakishly strong, given what the Fed has done over the past year. 
Um, and so that's a bit of a conundrum for economists, uh, because what we should see is demand really start to slow, um, companies to start to lay people off, and we haven't seen that much. There are signs that the labor market's easing a little bit, but it, it's incredibly tight still. Um, one of the reasons could be that the labor market is fundamentally smaller now, the labor force participation no. rate, than it was before the pandemic. Though that's mainly just for kind of 60 plus people. So the working age um, labor force participation rate has, has largely recovered. Um, so that's one factor. I think a much bigger factor um, is based on anecdata data rather than actual data, and it's labor hoarding, okay. which we've had in the US much more than Europe has. So. Uh, when we shut down the economy during the pandemic, companies laid people off in the U.S. and, so and beefed they still, up. They, they still lived, the people who were laid off. So they were there. Yeah, they, they, they fired back. them and yeah. beefed up their unemployment benefits. Okay. Whereas in Europe, you know, you had shorter working hours. Um, there was a real attempt to maintain a connection between employers and workers. The U.S. did it very differently so that when we then reopened the economy, it was a total nightmare for companies to try to find to try labor. And, find people young. and they had to pay them a lot more. So we've had stronger wage growth in the US as well. And so now that the economy is starting to slow down and companies are looking at the outlook and thinking we may well have a recession, um, they're hoarding labor because they don't want to go through that again. They don't want to lay people off and then have to go through the nightmare of hiring them, training them, and paying and them then more. And so the labor market's really held up incredibly well. Now, this can't last forever, and so that's the big question, because we don't know how to measure whether companies are hoarding labor or whether it really makes sense for them to keep workers on their balance sheets. But as corporate earnings are falling, companies yeah. at some point will have to capitulate and decide to lay people off finally. We just don't know where that inflection point is, but it's really important in figuring out sort of the path for the economy and for inflation, because the best indicator of a recession better than any economist, better than the yield curve, is an uptick in unemployment over a certain period of time. And Which so, in your uh, case. But as an economist, would you uh, say that all this idea of paradigm shift based on this matter of, uh, of uh, inflation and unemployment, this discussion will not pick up this time around? Paradigm shift is too big notion, too big a word so, to use. Yeah, I don't think this is, reflects a fundamental structural paradigm shift, particularly in terms of the labor market. I think it's a function of what we've just been through with the pandemic in the US labor market, that companies are hoarding labor and will end up having to capitulate. I do think there's a bit of a paradigm shift on the inflation front, though. And I, you know, I was ready to die on this hill that actually there wouldn't be a paradigm shift in inflation during the pandemic. But the invasion of Russia has really changed things. Um, if you believe that inflation has been structurally lower, in part because of an, a global glut of national savings, um, and, and that's kept inflation low and rates low and growth low, um, we're going to have to spend a lot on the green transition and on defense. And I think that will, on the margins... This will overcompensate. On the margins, it will whittle no. away some of that global glut of savings. And so inflation should structurally be a bit higher. Now, there are other factors that will lean against that. Um, you see, the, on, the, on the other hand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry. But I am an economist. Um, things like technological innovation, automation, digitalization... Okay. So I think it will really be on the margin. I, I don't think inflation will be 5% structurally going forward, but it may okay. be 3%, so a little bit higher than what we had expected before. Right, so uh, if technology allows us, I would like to have on our screens Mr. Sotrit from Belgrade. Do I have him? I don't have him, so you're a duo. <laughs> Coming back to you, uh, Mr. Ackerman, at the same time you, and we all living through the inflation stage, you had to cope with important, fear, important fears of uh, financial instability due to the banking crisis we imported from uh, the States, but then we got to know it, of it closer through the Swiss 
case. And you have a central bank. In fact, you don't have a central bank. We all have a central bank, being the ECB, which is torn uh, between trying to pull inflation down and then keep it down with sufficiently aggressive a monetary policy, although not that aggressive as the American one, while at the same time caring for the stability of European banks. In the Nordic states, Denmark excluded, he didn't have much fears about that. But when discussing this issue, this push and pull of central bank policy, of monetary policy, how do you assess which is the most important factor, dealing with inflation or ensuring that we won't have any kind of uh, financial problems through the bank and the non-banking bank sector? In, in Europe as a whole, uh, we have uh, pretty strict uh, banking rules nowadays after financial crisis uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago. And uh, as much as I know, Estonian banks, we, our banks are very well capitalized. Mm -hmm. And also in Estonia, due to that we have uh, a company's income tax in a such a way that you pay it when you take uh, dividends out only then you pay okay. income tax. That makes our banks and our private companies also very capitalized. And so right now, in our region, we uh, really do not have a great uh, threat about uh, this uh, mm -hmm. rising, rising interest will uh, could harm somehow seriously our, our banks or our uh, enterprises also. But what concerns... Um, uh, unemployment and inflation actually um, usually they come both hand in hand but the, right now this time we see all over the western world that at the same times as we have inflation and maybe there should be bankruptcies and should be, uh, companies should uh, leave uh, people out of labor uh, right now uh, we in Estonia also have very tight uh, uh, tight uh, labor uh, labor market, uh, even we have uh, 40,000, which is 4%, yes. uh, the people coming from Ukraine, and also one mm. quarter of them have found uh, work, and they are all working, and they are still working, working hands in several, uh, several uh, like, uh, sectors like agriculture. We still do not have enough uh, people to work in several. And also there is a lack of... Uh, uh, labor also in very high tech okay. and uh, with in IT sector which is strong in Estonia so but uh, I think I think this uh, three, three percentage I hope this is uh, old uh, normality which has came came back mm -hmm. me, me personally we have seen we remember also uh, interest rates uh, above uh, five even I remember in my career it was not uh, too many years ago but uh, right now, right now, uh, I think th this tight labor market is, as, as a politician, it, it's, it's a good thing that everyone has a job. But uh, as an economist, I, I am suspicious from where uh, can come the change oh. uh, economy or, or moving economy to the higher level or economy moving to the other to the other sectors like uh, greening sectors or new technology sectors, new uh, energy sectors. This is, this is maybe, maybe the uh, hardest question, uh, how, how to make this swift to the more sustainable economy. Right. Uh, a question I, that I will raise with you just after uh, Mr. Green deals with my previous one about the financial problems that we import. We are pleased to say we imported from America, but in fact, we did have them in Europe and in the heart of Europe. And by heart, I don't mean just Switzerland, but also Germany, in, for instance. Uh, but I would like you to start reflecting on, on my final question for this panel. How well 
prepared is the overall population in your country uh, for this kind of debate to be held publicly. Are people conversant, the man on the street, the woman in the street, are they conversant with this sort of issues or they discover problems when they actually happen with the upsurge of inflation? But first, let me go to Mr. Green. So, which is the most important problem to salvage or not to create potentially bank, uh, problems in the banking sector and in the shadow banking sector or to fight with inflation? Um, so I think as a central bank, most central banks have front and center in their mandate to price stability. Um, now, financial stability is baked into most central banks' mandates as well, but we have seen that there is a way to, to fight inflation and also support financial stability. The Bank of England did this last yeah. fall when guilt yields spiked um, and nearly brought down the pension system. The Bank of England, which wanted to shrink its balance sheet at the time, a, decided a very, not a very, to. A hard lesson. Yeah, but they the stepped in, way. and as they were hiking interest rates, they provided the liquidity operation to support the financial mm. services sector. So it can be pulled off, but it's really tricky. Um, I will say that um, central banks and economists like to think that there are very distinct tools for macro policy, so inflation, and for financial stability, on the other hand. Um, and unfortunately, those tools start to um, blend at a certain point. There is a gray area whereby financial instability starts to undermine um, the macro picture and inflation as well. And so I'll give you two very clear examples from what we saw in March in terms of the small regional banks in the US failing and then Credit Suisse having a shotgun marriage to UBS. Um, one channel through which financial instability feeds through into the economy yeah. is through confidence. Um, so if everybody starts to freak out that the financial system is going to go under, then they stop spending, and that's a big drag on growth and therefore inflation. Um, what we've seen, if you look at confidence indicators for the U.S. and for the Eurozone um, during and since the banking instability that we've seen recently, is that confidence has held up really well. So that doesn't seem to be a channel so far that's really applied here. Um, the other channel is through lending, and that's still a big unknown. Um, you know, there is a concern that banks will stop lending so much so that they can shore up their balance sheets and show how responsible they are. Um, and there's another concern, particularly in the U.S., that will be facing new regulation, and that's almost a certainty, um, but that banks will start to implement what they anticipate that regulation to be in advance. Yeah. And so they're more conservative with their lending already. We saw that after the global financial crisis, so that's possible. And if banks stop lending so much, then that's a big break on the economy as well. So the two are really um, intertwined. I actually don't think that, that um, a, a contraction in lending is inevitable. Um, it wasn't loan books that were the problem in, any of, in the case of any of the banks that um, failed. It was actually a lack of loans and, and the fact that a lot of banks in the US at least parked um, deposits into treasuries. And so there were liquidity mismatches. Um, and so, you know, not lending as much doesn't do anything to solve that problem. Um, the real problem was interest rate risk. Um, so I'm not sure that we'll see um, the two coincide so much in this particular case. But we like to, to think them as problem. very distinct yeah. issues. And they're not in real life. They end up overlapping quite a lot. And so central banks do end up having to, to try to deal with both at the same time. I mentioned the Bank of England example because it was a success. Um, I think there's a real risk in central banks repeating that example over and over, though. And I should say, I think, that as most central banks are shrinking their balance sheets, hiking rates, liquidity is being withdrawn from the system, we're going to hit more pockets of market dislocation. Um, and it will be up to central banks to step in and paper over those. But if central banks keep providing QE um, yeah. to pocket over those um, blow-ups in the markets, Eventually, investors might think, well, hang on, QE is inflationary, um, which is debatable in and of itself. But if, if that's what the prevailing thought is, um, then... If this is the prevailing thought, 
it will happen. It will end up happening. Yeah, and so then investors will think, well, this is inflationary, and that will undermine exactly what central banks are trying to do in leaning against inflation, and so that could make uh, central banks' lives much harder for them. So that's a risk I would highlight. Ms. Green, uh, I have a very peculiar question for you. You are teaching. You are a teacher. Yeah. So you have students. Would you say that these students are having a harder time to get acquainted to the intricacies of the profession nowadays than, let's say, 20 years ago when we were starting with the discourse of the Phillips curve, or 40 years ago before the consensus appeared to the profession? Uh, no, the opposite, actually. I think my students are a lot more savvy and sophisticated than I was when I was their age learning the same topics, probably just because information is so um, freely available everywhere. There are so many possible sources. So I think students, and particularly in financial markets, mm -hmm. students are much more engaged with what's going on in financial markets. One thing I will say, though, is that the day after the Fed announced that it would yes. um, you know, implicitly guarantee deposits across the entire US banking system, and it set up a liquidity facility where it would accept collateral at par um, you know, for the next year, um, that was huge. I had a bunch of colleagues in financial services come to me and ask if they should move their deposits out of their banks. So it's not my students I'm worried about. It's actually but, many of my colleagues who, professional colleagues. who clearly yeah. didn't recognize what the Fed had done. And if, if they feel that way, um, I'm not surprised that it took the markets generally a couple days to digest what had happened. So those kinds of things are really difficult to communicate to regular people. So over to Ms. Ackerman. Regular people, I don't know whether you are also a professional economist or not, but you are a politician. So you have to communicate things to public opinion. And you have to accept, normally, that their opinion will guide much of your moves. Yeah. How mature is public opinion nowadays, according to your experience, as proven but th by this situation? Yeah, I, I am an economist and I have studied uh, finance and business administration and had, I have been working in this field before, before being a politician for long years. So for public, um, for public uh, opinion, I think um, in Eastern Europe we have, we have seen so many crashes. But right now um, I would tell uh, to people, to ordinary regular people that uh, and financially, no, no panic because everything is really under control financially. So not, not big worries about it. So uh, we're nearing the end of uh, our session. The timer ticks down. I'm pleased to announce to the forum people that we are leaving them with some seconds of spare time. And I would like to thank Ms. Sackerman, Ms. Green, to say I'm sorry that Mr. Sotsky would not reach us. And uh, quite incredibly, I feel that we are going off with some uh, measure of uh, optimism out of a panel dealing with inflation and unemployment. So thank you indeed for helping us in this uphill mission. Thank you, thank you all.